Here we are, part two. Let's see how far we are from Skynet learning how to bunker rush, this time on Inside the Scene. Hit it, Tara. Hello, 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 my drones, pylons, and probes. Welcome to Inside the Scene. I'm your host, Drexama, and this is the show where we pick up the best topics of StarCraft to mine through. I'm joined here with the incalculable Ender Sword. I, I like that right. one. I like that one. Pretty, pretty good. <laughs> but again, you went drones, pylons, probes. Where are the SCPs? <laughs> I know we don't have Taryn on this double, show. Double, that's a good, that's a good call, actually. <laughs> no Taryn on this no, show, man. None, none of that. Taren, absolutely none. I refuse okay. to let those Taryn, no. those Taryn hordes yeah. join our show. True. But, True uh, enough. Here we are, back, back again for some inside the scene. How are you feeling? How are you feeling? Feeling, for feeling pretty good. This is this is one of my more favorite topics. So I like I when know. we get. To, yeah, I like when we get to do this. Yeah. This sort of AI minded, deep mindy body, whatever type of stuff. Yeah, the, the technical, the deep, the, the machine meeting human, human yeah. control. Um, you know, you casted Probots. So this topic, I think, is right up that alley in terms of wrapping it around and, and people who uh, get an opportunity to learn a bit more. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it seems to be an area of, of community interest. And even beyond the community, like a lot of people that just work with this sort of thing or are interested in it in general, like, you know, I never played Go, but once there was like DeepMind Go stuff, then I was all over it. So it does bring interest to the to the game from the outside as well. So I think that's always a good thing. And that's, I think, really the most important thing. And uh, in terms of for StarCraft and how this all relates, and even this episode, is that if you're someone here and you found this episode maybe a year from when it's been aired, and you're like, man, I, I just watched this, this bot destroy SOS or innovation, and I want to know more, this episode's for you. And then we're hoping that we can give you and the future you and the future everybody a little bit of, uh, a primer of what to what this all means. Like, what does this future look like? Um, so, hello from the past. So always, always yeah. the past. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've talked many times. I think we've made. I think there were jokes on Probots that um, you know a bot could go back in time. With yeah, full sentience and or just yeah, and punish everyone that didn't help. Yes. Yeah, what was right. that called? That was that was uh, like Roko, Roko's Basilisk. Yeah, I believe. Yeah there's, go back in time. yeah, there's different iterations of it, whether it goes back in time or not. But either way, it punish, <laughs> either way, it punishes people. <laughs> either way, people get punished. And hopefully we aren't punished because we decided to do this episode where we explain its origins. So we'll yeah. find out. But before that, let's get into the segments. You guys know the drill. Uh, we do the different segments that helps shine different parts of the community. That's just us doing our part. Uh, but starting it off, question of the day. Who, and by who, I mean like, which character in StarCraft would make a good co-op commander? That's the question of the day, and you know the answer. If you know the, if you have a thought, throw it into the chat. Who would you think would make a good co-op commander? Dave. I got, I got a few answers, I think, now. I, I think one is Mansk. Oh my so god, why, that actually is a good one. Why, why is there not, like, there's not, like, any of the bad guy guys in the Terran side so why not Manx? I think he'd right, be pretty right. neat he could have like a bunch of stuff to deploy and whatever that would be a good one I think right. the over the overmind itself from uh the Zerg side would be good holy crap yeah I thought you were going to give any good answer for this <laughs> I had to I literally had to go look up the commanders to make sure that Manx wasn't already one because <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't play them but I think that would be like a decent one Right. Yeah, over mine. And then I also think uh, for the protests, I think three probes stacked on top of each other wearing a trench coat. 
would be good and just pretending to like be grown ups. <laughs> <laughs> the weirdest part is that actually could be fun, like a Probius, the yeah. Probius crew. Yeah. Um, I think you could do that. That would make a pretty yeah. good. Um, I also think there should be a neutral commander where you play as the destructible rocks and in like inanimate objects in the game. <laughs> you like, you yeah. like. <laughs> yeah, the Dustin Browder character. So you <laughs> control the rocks. Like, so the enemy, all you have to do, like, there's different rocks around the map. You control them. When the enemy starts to come through, you collapse on them and stuff like that. <laughs> I feel like there's this level of modding of the, sh the actual game to make that happen would have definitely, definitely do it. I I would okay, so I would. I can't even count. I, you know what? I feel weird because I can't top those. <laughs> okay, so my my choices originally, um, I was gonna say General Duke. Yeah, he would be a good one. I was gonna say start pulling like we're bringing people who are dead. Obviously, yeah. we because it doesn't matter. Like, yeah, people have said that before too. Like for this one, like, isn't Zero Tool dead? Zero Tool's dead. Who tells? Like, I don't know when these happened. It's are we saying that co-op commanders are after the campaign? We're not really, right? They're in a different so, universe. So it's kind of like world. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like um, Heroes of the Storm, where it happens outside yeah. the timeline, yeah, exactly. or you know, or Spider-Man's interdimensional, where he pulls like all twenty Spider-Mans into one world. Yeah, so it's, it's all fair. It's all fair. You can pull from anywhere, right? Yeah. So you can pull like, what's her name? Um, Dr. Halen or whatever. Mm -hmm. Jim, Jim Rayner's lover doctor yeah. who dies or turns yeah. into a... Exactly. Why not? Alien. Or you could, the Overmind, you can bring the Overmind. Heck, why don't we just use Lieutenant Morales, like the medic? He, she, yeah. can be a, she can be a co-op commander. Um, what else? Oh, you know, what's her name? Um, one of the... One of Kerrigan's like, oh, what's her? The one that has like the tentacle arms coming down. Not, not Avatar, but it was like it was a female Zerg woman. Oh my god, uh, she would have been a kind of fun too. I don't know. I thought they she looked really Zagara. cool. They have Zagara, right? No, 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 not Zagara. The one, Zagara, but another one. The one that like helps Kerrigan like remember stuff, or when she's supposed to be like uh, the adjudicant for the Zerg, whatever. Her, she would be cool. Oh, is is saw or something? Is yes, yes, is yes. Saw? That's the one. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. the one. Her, she yeah. would be pretty cool. Yeah, she's yeah. fused to a ship. Okay, She'd be cool. I'd like yeah. her. Yeah, um, that'd be a good one. Kerrigan, human, human, human character. Yeah, and uninfested Stukov. Uninfested Stukov, right? You could <laughs> yeah. totally pull like um, a Dragon Ball Z slash Capcom, where you like you have one form and the other form, or yeah, like she or, can, she you can know. Kill. Zero Suit Samus and Samus, you know, yeah. with her, front, her, her her thing, or Zelda and Sheik. Why not yeah. Kerrigan and Infested Kerrigan? Yeah, that would be cool. If you could switch between, like, you have to go cocoon yourself for, like, 60 seconds to, like, switch or something. <laughs> it could be part of it. <laughs> the transformation yeah. element. Yeah. Which, like, she, like, turns in, you know, super dreadlocks versus no yeah. super dreadlocks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I also think, why can't we play as, like, Automaton bot 2000 or whatever the house in there, or like the Tastosalope or whatever's in, <laughs> in the thing, like the critters, man. <laughs> There's all kinds of critters. That's not, is, 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 is Tastosalope actual, that's not an actual critter, is it? Uh, there's something named something like that. There's Ursula. There's definitely something in there named after like uh, Artos is in there. Yeah, yeah, there is, right? Or an, or an Ursodon, yeah, would be good. Ursodon, wow. The really big thing. Yeah. All right, this is a good opportunity to like, let's go back in the day and, oh, actually, no, sorry, let's StarCraft Challenge number one. You guys know how the StarCraft Challenge works. Uh, you watch a video, do you know who the person is? You let us know in the chat. Tara, let's see who are, who this player could be.
I feel like that one is probably the easiest like StarCraft challenge we've ever done. Maybe. Um, we always we next keep to getting, SD. Yeah. Well, we keep getting surprised a little by some people that like are newer and maybe don't know. Not that he's this one's still around, but Nesty, for instance, like some people didn't know that. Yeah, that's true. Because they just weren't around. But yeah, yeah. But hopefully, if you don't know this guy, get your get your NA better. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's even true. though he's SA technically. I think I think they include. I think it's considered NA. I know for which is got to be. It's really the Americas, but we the always Americas, call it, yes. we always call it NA because they used to be separate. Mm -hmm. Like they yeah, used, used to be, be way part more. Of yeah. Were they like gathered in C? Like it wasn't it like. South America um, plus C or no? I forget. I or what it was it or was it Latin? No, Latin America. La La Latin. Latin America had its own, which is also that's really only the middle part. And then there was the whole other and that's what Yeah, Latin America used to be considered separate. Yeah. Um its own thing. I think Latin America now was just merged with the Americas. But yeah. um now it's all the Americas. No, it's all all one. All the Americas. Until all are one. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um why don't you kick us off to the next thing? What's, what's going on? So I think we are up to now our StarCraft challenge. Or sorry, that was the StarCraft challenge. Now we're do back to the day. Do we have a back to the day today? Yeah, we do. We do. All right. Let's, let's, kick, let's kick to see what happened back in the day a long time ago. see it in time to respond he's moving the mutalisks back continuing to add more mutas on er, as well mma advancing forward has a great marine count 53. yeah and uh where did that medevac go i'm not sure he's taking out the oh oh oh, oh no oh, oh my goodness mma oh marcus that is also not a good use of a third command center no it is not no, it is not. The uh, also the medevac is about to get spotted. It is going to go down. He'll take out the mutilus count. Banelings getting absolutely obliterated by these tanks, but the mutilus count is just a little bit too high. Indra now streaming forward with zerglings, mutas, everything is overrunning the force by MMA. Wait, oh! what? What? Did Idra just leave another one game? That was ideal. That I was, love that one. That was great. I love that it's two things. Like, the killing your own CC is already, like, clippable. Yes. But, killing, <laughs> but like, killing your own CC and then having your opponent immediately leave the game, not knowing that you did it is like awesome it was a two and a one right so when, when we picked yeah. that that one it was like okay well yeah killing your own cc yeah. in itself is a back in the day moment worthy yeah. worthy of discussion but killing your own c and then winning yeah is even better it was like the most like suck the energy out of the crowd thing that has happened i think in sc2 and, and, and the funny thing is, I believe that is the same MLG when he leave, left against Huck in the same. I, I, think, I feel like this is the exact. I feel like it might have been. Yeah, I, I don't know. I I want to check. It was definitely like that year. I pretty. I think it's no. I think it's the same. You think it's the same one? I think it's the same tournament. Yeah. Now, or it might be the same year. Was that Columbus? I forget. Yes, that, that was I, Columbus. Yeah, that was Columbus. So I think I, I think someone, it's the same same tournament. Mm -hmm. Same tournament. Same day. <laughs> that Idra left, yeah. but Huck had left. The game between him and Huck had yeah. happened earlier in the tournament. Right. So 
Yeah, and I think too, at some point, they, the D, day nine or DJ Wee's like, did he just leave again? So I feel like that was yeah. a, a uh, moment number two. I love looking back at the old like clips and like the webcams look like pictures of people trapped in a basement or something. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like <laughs> Or something. It's always it's always like up here, like looking down on them, and there's that weird like haze, and it's like a security camera sort of thing. It's <laughs> it's really weird. You're talking about like the booth, the booth, yeah, like, the, like booth. the booth. They didn't have like the cameras weren't like centered in front of them. It was like this weird. Oh, from like, like below. Sometimes they have it from below looking. Yeah, up they had the there. below like a weird shot, or they'd have it like above, but it looked like. It like was, a, like a camera trapped in their keyboard looking. Yeah, like it looked like this weird voyeur shot. Like they weren't aware that it was there. Or something. And like like yeah. someone capturing capturing like yeah. illicit illicit video in a stall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, uh, well, that's you know it's it's the best thing about these back in the days. You get an, a sense of how far we as a scene has come. Yeah. And you know what is yeah. something also interesting to notice? We don't use booths anymore. We don't use yeah, uh, soundproof booths anymore. So I don't know if that's just StarCraft doesn't warrant the investment or they know. turned out to be almost every soundproof booth, and you could probably attest to this too. Every soundproof booth was not soundproof. No, it oh, absolutely just, not. It was just a plywood booth. <laughs> like it, it was like they were just pieces of plywood put together. There was no soundproofing in it. So was it like so, this, it must have been like a psychological thing then? Like, I think so. Were... It was to do a little separation, but the the real soundproofing for anyone that doesn't know really comes from headphones over top of earbuds with white noise being with white in. noise being pumped in. That's the only way to do it because like you can put people in whatever booths, but they can feel like vibrations and they may they wouldn't be able to like make out words. But they know, like if if the crowd starts cheering and they're like, "All right, nothing's happened," so mm -hmm. Maru is proxying me. Like they knew stuff like that. I remember that it used to be it used to be mandatory that you had to have a soundproof booth at a love, high level tournament. It was yeah. like you had to exactly. But, what an absorbent. But they were just really. They, it really came down to you had to have a booth. Yeah. But it wasn't. It wasn't soundproof. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So last thing before we go into our, our guests and people, you know, we always get great feedback from this. So let's see some art. Let's see some art from around the community. Let's do it. last two of those I was, nicholas uh, Chiswa, obviously always oh my god like, amazing stuff and that like captured it so well but oh i love that i love the tattoo before then too like, oh yeah you see it, i was gonna say my comment on the tattoo was i love the tattoo but i could never put something like that no, on my body like that's that would crazy. Be, that's I've so intense i've considered like getting something like i would never do something like visible most of the time either but what, what's the I, point of a tattoo if it's not visible? I don't understand. I like it's visible sometimes, but you want it to be like something that you can easily hide when it's not appropriate. So like, like on your, where, like your uh, shoulder kind of thing where you can yeah, like- Yeah, something at my shoulder, but then if I'm wearing like a short sleeve thing at work or something, like if you're wearing a polo or something, it's not right down. Ah, okay. um, so it'd be way like up that. on the top of the, like your shoulder. Yeah, almost. like shoulder blade or chest or something. But I've considered just getting the Protoss logo. I've just never done it. Oh, like, I think we have but I think that's like pretty time. Like at this point, you can say it's pretty timeless. Like, we had this discussion before yeah, about the idea yeah. of putting about putting like game paraphernalia on one's body yeah. um, because people do Mushroom Kingdom all the time and Zelda, you know, yeah. stuff. But I, I, it's actually a part of our culture now. So I, so now I took yeah. the time after like, the episode to think about 
you know what? I guess it's not so bad because it's it's a cultural thing, and and tattoos are essentially expression of yourself and culture. So I'm like, okay, that would I, yeah, I guess as long that. as it's never gonna be something that like completely goes away. Like if you got a Fortnite tattoo, you're probably an idiot. <laughs> and I know, <laughs> like, and I know someone that got like even Dota. I think is long enough, but I I know someone that got a Dota two tattoo that they actually put the two in it. I'm like, you could have. What if Dota 3 comes out? <laughs> well, that's it. You could have gotten the Dota logo, which has been relatively. Like, the Dota logo is pretty much just a MOBA map in a logo, right? Yes. And so you could have got that. If people forget its meaning, then it wouldn't matter because it doesn't say. Like, I don't want words. Anytime you put the words, it wrecks it. To well, me. because you put the logo. All, you get old. And, you get old. Yeah. Your body changes. Yeah. So if you put, like, freaking words on there and it says you know my life for ire it might like as your body gets saggy it might be like yeah it'd be like i have a tire <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly but it, it yeah and it also like the same with i wear like a lot of like i like wearing like the geek shirts and stuff like that but i never like it when it just says like across the middle like starcraft 2 i prefer it just is that's that's even all right ish because it's not like super again i want it to be that if somebody knows what it is they know what it is and if somebody doesn't know what it is then they just don't know what it is like i, I actually so actually i have a, a personal vendetta against like graphic tees but since yeah. we started doing a lot of starcraft stuff like was, like i have gotten a ton of like starcraft particular graphic stuff so the only graphic tees i wear are starcraft related graphic tees and the thing is whenever i go somewhere I always get approached by somebody and they're like, yeah. man, I loved StarCraft. I used to play StarCraft when I was a kid or, you know, man, I remember my first Canon Rush. You're like, yes. Yeah, see, it's the yeah, other conversation <laughs> starters. Yeah, same with like all my t-shirts are like gaming, maybe not just, Star most of them are StarCraft, but at least gaming related. And it always, but I always pick something that's like a little obscure, but it, it doesn't just say what it is. Like one of them, I think the thing under this is like, it's a diagram of a gun from like the gravity gun from Half-Life and stuff. For like, me, so if someone knows what it is, they know what it is. Other people don't. I would, I just want things, if I'm doing geeky clothes, I want it to look like the average clothes, but geeky. It's almost like it's yeah. a secret language, right? Right, it, that, exactly. Yeah, that's what I mean. I just want it to be, I want it to be stylish, but like geeky. Yeah. That's like, I, I don't know. And the Jinx thing is very, like, Jinx used to be do that kind of stuff. And now it's more, a bit more like Overwatch and over, yeah. you know, too much. But mm -hmm. all right, let's, let's, oh, by the way, guys, uh, one of the, my, my, before we jump into our stuff, one of the key things about Arts and Starcraft that I love, um, we put inside the show notes the link to those creators. And sometimes they have stuff to buy. I always recommend, like, if you like some of the art that we show off, go grab some of their stuff grab a shirt, grab a mug. Um, not all the artists do that, but like some of them do. Um, and some of them have like Instagrams or whatever. We show this stuff because we're hoping that you can guys will meet and see some people who do cool art and yeah. make them your, you know, make them your artists uh, and patron their, their, their galleries. All right, so on to today's topic, SE2, AI and deep mind. Um, Dave, we've had we've done this on a previous show, Inside the Champ, but this is kind of the first time we're going to be talking about on Inside the Scene uh, about AIs in general. Yeah. So, what do you? What's your? You have a bit more AI knowledge than, than us, but what would you do to pre prepare our audience to, before we go into this? Uh, you know? I think the I think the important thing, I guess, and we'll we'll talk about it with the the guests coming up is understanding the different types of AI that people. That, that exist out there. So the AI that we've been doing are really bots AI that we've been doing in tournaments where it's primarily scripted. Some of them have had some machine learning elements in it, but it's, it's primarily scripted out. It's following instructions, a series of conditions leading to a result. Uh, that's a lot different than what DeepMind is trying to do itself. And I think you need a little bit to understand like both parts to make it really go well and it, like the same in the history of chess that a lot of the computers were the the other sort of where it was scripted out or they were told certain things and then it was kind of making decisions based on that whereas now it's moving again into a more 
learning on its own sort of thing. Give it so, a blank slate and then it has yeah, to kind of exactly. figure out. Just tell it, here's chess, and then it figures out what to do compared to the old days where they would tell it, a rook is worth five, a queen is worth nine. Like, this is your goal. This is a good position. This is a bad position. Here's a bunch of opening moves, like where they fed it a bunch of stuff. So there's differences between that, and our guests can get more into it. But I think that's one of the, the biggest things is understanding there's different ways to approach this problem of, you know, machine learning versus scripting versus supervised, unsupervised. Um, and there's ways, interfaces, like how DeepMind sees a game, there's a difference between reading the code and responding to it versus seeing it visually or, or whatever. And, and even more basic than that, um, the, if you don't know what DeepMind is, DeepMind is the project created by Google, um, which you know essentially is their, their answer kind of to the AlphaGo, um, what was the one before AlphaGo? Uh, AlphaZero, Alpha well, AlphaZero Alpha is the, Chess one, AlphaGo is the Go one, obviously. One. And yeah. AlphaGo, if you're not familiar, recently, I don't know, two years ago, three years ago, beat the greatest Go player in the world. They made a movie. It's on Netflix. Highly recommend you go watching. It's really good. Peace said all. Um, and yeah. now the next frontier is StarCraft. StarCraft is an infinitely more difficult game, which we will explore shortly yeah. through this episode. All right, without further ado, I think that's enough primer for a lot of our audience here. Um, and also guys, feel free to ask questions in the chat. This couldn't, this can get a little technical. So if there's a part where we go a little far and you don't know, throw a question in the chat, we'll read it out. I'm yeah. um, assuming it's, it's related to the topic and we'll, we'll get, we'll kind of, we'll, we're here to guide you here. Yeah. All right, without okay. further ado. So, for example, SARSA means state action response, state action. So it's no, a, someone actually asked that question. Yeah, yeah. so it's, a, it's apparently a simple-ish way of evaluating the state of something, taking an action, responding to it, and then basically a loop of that. But, All right, and this, that's a great segue to introduce our guests, all right, so both hailing from the StarCraft, AI, Starcraft 2 AI uh, community, we have Nick or Nike. Hi guys. And okay. Kevin Conrad H. Jacks. H. Jacks. How's it going? I, I couldn't tell him. I didn't, is, he, is he alive? H. Jacks? I think I, I think he's alive. Oh, I, 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 did, I, I didn't hear you. Sorry. He keeps, he keeps changing color though. <laughs> yeah. my. I think the I'm yellow is good. Once I win ProBots again, I'll get it. But maybe. Yeah. So, so both of both of uh, these gentlemen here have entered bots into ProBots and have created bots of them their own, which is obviously necessary to be in ProBots. And then both bots have made it very far into the tournament, and they compete on the SE2AI.net ladder. So we have, I think, we're in good hands in terms of at least people who can guide us through this maze. So, how are you feeling? Feeling you're up for the task? You're up for the task, guys? So ready. All right. All right. <laughs> Booyaka Sha. Um, I think the first step I want to do, uh, why don't you guys give us a little bit, a, a pro give the audience a primer on your individual bots and uh, just like a, just a, like a, an overview of your general experience with bots. Uh, why don't we start with you, Nick? Sure. Um, so I wrote Sarsa bot. I also wrote... Uh, two other bots, one called Naughty Bot and one called a Velo Bot. Do you say naughty? Um, like naughty bot? Naughty bot. Yeah. He's naughty well, because he, he proxy rexes. He's a meme. <laughs> <laughs> He's very quick. He, you know, within like uh, three minutes, you have like five Marines at your base and like, you know, causes trouble. So in the beginning, that was very strong, but it, it was really just a bunch of spaghetti code. And it was, I don't know, like 500 lines of code in C sharp. And I didn't know anything about writing bots and it worked out pretty well. So that was my first bot, Naughty Bot. Then I wrote a Velo bot, which uh, you know that played in ProBots 1 mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately lost against five minutes bot, five minute bot. But it, basically the idea was that it sort of like replicates a Velo's play style, which I actually thought would be sort of like useful for, um, for bot, uh, bot versus bot play, but Turns out it's not that great, you know, somehow. Like, or maybe I just coded it badly. It well, just, for human versus human play, it's not that great either, so it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, did, it did do some interesting things. It turns out that other bots don't know where Siege Tank range ends. 
Yeah. So that, yeah. that worked out well. Yeah. And it, it did like stuff like flying to the corner and, you know, um, BMing the opponent. So uh, yeah. I tried to make it as real as uh, possible. Uh, and then lastly, for the last tournament, uh, I created Sarsabot, <coughs> which is the, um, the other two bots were scripted. Sarsabot is the only one that sort of like uses some machine learning elements. So um, it's not a pure, you know, unsupervised machine learning product like, uh, you know, AlphaGo or AlphaZero, Lila Chess Zero, any of those. Uh, it really is a hybrid machine learning approach. So I actually created a video on that. You can see that, you know, it's, it outlines how the SARSA algorithm works uh, if it's only used on a single Reaper. Um, but the idea is that over several iterations of training, um, you know, if you give it very specific commands or like very specific options that the individual units can do, such as attack, retreat, or, you know, in case of an SCV, you know, like expand or build a depot, if you have specific actions that, uh, that the AI can choose from, then the SARS algorithm over time with enough training should be able to produce decent results. I, I don't want to say good results, but like okay-ish results. Um, and you know, if you do it right, hopefully with enough of these convenience functions that I add, um, it should be uh, it should be even possible to do that on a competitive level, and with competitive, I mean bot versus bot, not bot versus human. Mm -hmm. All right, East Jack, so why don't you give us your primer? All right, so I'm a Grandmaster StarCraft player, so I'm kind of obsessed with writing bots that play like people do, even if that isn't necessarily optimal. <laughs> so I different Zerg bots that are primarily focused on like sort of standard looking macro play. Um, and the most recent of which is currently ranked two on the ladder. So it's doing pretty okay. Uh, it's still pretty easy to cheese out, which is a little disappointing, but <laughs> the scene is still young. Um, but yeah, my, my bots are kind of focused on playing, at least from my perspective, reasonable play styles and reasonable reactions. Oh, why don't you tell us the name of the bots and just uh, give okay, us a so I wrote HX AI, which was the, the winner of the first season of ProBots. And it was written in C++, which I'm not amazing at. So it was kind of spaghetti code and had a lot of bugs. So <laughs> I rewrote it in Java, which I'm better at, and created my current bot, which is uh, called Kagamine. And it is, uh, it's all right. <laughs> It does okay. Um, it'll be playing in the next season of ProBots, so hopefully, hopefully, will, it does well. Will it be a little bit upgraded? Like, is there going to be changes from its current ladder iteration to between yes, now and then? When I get around to writing those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you guys are, we talked about this uh, like when we were watching games last season, and it ended up being the uh, type of bot that won, but a lot of the bots did end up being vulnerable to very specific types of cheeses, whether it was worker rushes or in the end uh, series there, zealot rushes. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in particular now that you guys are like writing or remaking things, or I guess it's probably different a bit for Sarsa bot because it's, it's trying to do what's going to do. <laughs> yeah. It's going to do what it thinks is right. But when you're making stuff like these bots, do you have a checklist in your mind of like, it has to be able to do this. It has to be able to do this, defend this. Like, are there certain barriers to entry or something that you have in mind of if it can't do this, then it's not ready yet? Uh, do you want to go first, Nike, or should I? Um, again, I think it's very different for the for the Sarsa bot, at least. Um, yeah, yeah Sar Sarsa bot's goal is that it figures it out and you don't have to do it. So, <laughs> yeah. That would be the ideal scenario. Um, so, so when you do something, when you do a machine learning approach, uh, it doesn't help to sort of say, "Oh, I, you know, the here, are, here are the pixels. Just you know, try to figure it out." Uh, you know, that is sort of like that is actually the deep mind approach, and that's you know, it's amazing that they can actually make that work, um, as as you know, we will see in the videos. But for me, it's not possible to do that really. So, sort of, I sort of like need more structure than that. So you cannot say, uh, here's a blank slate, try to make it work. Um, you basically have to modular, modularize uh, the, uh, your product. So 
I have four different modules. Um, the three important ones are the production manager. That's a, um, a specific AI that works on creating production decisions, such as, well, should we you know, build a roach warrant? Should we build roaches or mute, mute us or whatever we should build? Or drones, too many oftentimes. Um, the other one is the combat decision AI. So that is uh, when you actually have units, that's sort of like an additional um, AI that decides when to attack, when, when or if it should actually defend or rather go for counterattack and all those kind of things. And then lastly, there is a, there is a the smaller level is the unit AI or I would, in my case, it's the cluster AI because you, co you uh, control a cluster of units. And so these, uh, this AI needs to be able to um, hide other units, engage effectively with them, and you know, do some micro, you know, make sure you avoid the biles and uh, you know, stuff like that. So all of these take a lot of time, a lot of effort. And what you saw in ProBots 2 um, in the finals was actually only containing the production decision AI and the combat decision AI. So it didn't have any micro, which is why it lost so many roaches right. versus- um, Yes, I remember that. Or it like, the um, it had zero micro for the uh, for the worker rush, and uh, I actually didn't expect him to like do this again. So I sort of like, you know, took out the really easy fix for that, and yeah, obviously it 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 came back to haunt me. But, <laughs> but it's not easy. You know, you basically have to uh, you have to basically modularize the things, and then step by step make sure that each each of the modules work sufficiently well and they will never work very well they will only be like adequate you know and so this is how you go along at least in my opinion when you do machine learning or like hybrid machine learning as i'm doing it is that a limitation of just where we're at now with the technology or is that more of a limitation on just resources your ability or some of that of the above so my abilities are very low <laughs> so I, would, <laughs> I would i would definitely think this is a limiting factor you know one of the one of my issues is that when i do things i like to do them completely from scratch like everything just so that i fully understand every detail of what i'm uh, what i'm doing and so everything i'm building is basically from from the bottom up and you know i have some other advanced concepts that i'm using but the but they're not as promising to be honest like the most promising concepts are sort of like the simple things that i can deal with because i see results immediately or much much quicker for example if i have to train a neural network to um you know to to get the uh, sorry, just train a neural network it would take me two to three days and then my bot does something and you know maybe it works maybe it doesn't i cannot really tell you why it works or why it doesn't work whereas if you do it in a sim simplistic approach with Sarsa, you, know, you have a table, you're able to sort of like go back, figure out what exactly happened at each step, why it's doing this, and you can see improvements much faster. And that keeps me motivated. You know, like seeing improvements, seeing how the bot after like only 70 iterations can already uh, have very advanced micro decisions, uh, that is really motivating. That really helps me to move forward. Hmm. All right. I actually want to go more on that, but I'm curious. I want to hear hear H. Jax's answer to the first question. All right. So at least for for my bots, since I want it to play like a person, uh, I am writing a lot of or working on a lot of features that are designed to make it more sort of reactive, where it's not, oh, I am being cannon rushed, execute the specific cannon rush response, or I am being bio all in, execute the specific bio all in response. I want it to like scout maybe figure out what its opponent's unit composition is and maybe the level of commitment and then make a reasonable guess based on some probably horribly fuzzy math to decide how many drones can I build? What unit comp should I go? Um, so hopefully the, the end goal is that eventually it doesn't just die horribly to things it hasn't seen before because at <laughs> least for a, a vast majority of builds will be kind of catched in sort of one of these categories where it's like, Oh, okay. You have you have five racks on on two base. I see a bunch of bio. I know a composition that's good against a bunch of bio. You're in two base, so I guess I can go like fifty drones or something like that, and like get good enough behavior where 
it'll do something reasonable, even if it's not optimal. Is that you like creating that decision tree or does it figure so, out that so the, the, the goal, the goal is to do it based on some math, right? Like you're allowed to have I don't know, 10 more workers than your opponent or something like that when you're holding an all in. So the idea would be at scouts, it says, ah, you're all inning me. You have too much production. You don't have a third base. And then it would say, all right, I'm going to drone up to 10 more workers than what you have and then flood units. So the idea is, even though the a lot of the decisions will be hard coded, uh, it'll kind of create a slightly different response to every strategy it runs up against and hopefully oh. do reasonable things against all of them. Uh, obviously, you're going to be able to dig up some crazy build that it makes some bad decision against. But the <laughs> idea is, for the, for the most part, it'll do something reasonable. And that's based off of more your knowledge of the games. You have to give it that information to, yeah, to yeah. figure so it I'm, out. I'm going to spit out some fuzzy equations that may or may not produce good drone numbers. But, you know, uh, if it's consistent and does something, it like, I don't know, I guess as long as... So a lot of the scripted bots feel like they, they do one very, very exact thing. Uh, so for instance, in the ladder tournament, uh, recently it was won by Seabot. And Seabot went into a wall off with cannons into two base and would move out with, I think, eight carriers. And it would do that every single game with very, eight very carriers? little. Eight carriers, yeah, on two base. It would just sit there and make carriers until it had enough and it would move out. And there was no variation in its strategy pretty much at all. It would do that or it would die trying to do that. Um, so I'm trying to work on on features where it'll maybe scout its opponent unit opponent's unit composition and look up. I'll tell it, you know, here's some unit counters that might be useful, and it will look up in its table and go, ah, you're doing you're going mech. Maybe I should make some vipers or something like that. Uh, so I want it to be sort of dynamic and sort of reactive, but it will still have a lot of hard coded knowledge, and it won't do the exact same thing every game. And I found that your bot does have a bit of variation to it. Um, yeah. So one least... thing you guys probably saw in ProBots is when my bot spooks, it'll build a bunch of spines. Yeah, it, it freaks out. <laughs> it, it drone scouts, and if it sees nothing in your base, it'll actually send a second drone scout to look for proxies. Uh, and if it finds a proxy, it'll build a bunch of spines. And if it ca it counts your production structures uh, on one base, so it'll say, you're on one base with four barracks. That's too many. You haven't expanded. I need spines. Um, but if it scouts and says, oh, wait, you're, you're Reaper expanding. You have one Rax and a CC. It'll go, oh, that's fine. It'll drone right up. So no. it, it tries to not just be like a train on tracks going down its one very specific path every game. So wait, so it acts the, so uh, you mentioned something very interesting there. So it, it makes a decision when it gathers information. So it right. has to go and gather that information before it makes its decision. Is yes. that correct? Like, because like, well, so it's, it'll, it's it'll, on one base, it would have to go and check the other bases. It has it's it's more like forks in the road. So it has, it has its its plan, right? If it doesn't uh, see anything weird, it'll say, ah, well, I'm going to do the thing I like to do, which against Terran is like heavy zergling into Mita. Against Protoss is like a Ling Hydra composition. But if it sees something that says, I shouldn't be doing that. I'm getting cheesed. I'm getting all end. It'll react accordingly. Uh, and eventually, I'm going to also make it vary its unit composition based on what it's playing against. I guess one one thing to add to that is when you have scripted bots uh, like Ajax version, it's it can serve as a really nice practice partner, you know. And that's something that Ajax right. and I talked about before. Like you want to practice against like a you know a three base uh, zergling all in, you know. And then it's really nice to actually play that versus Ajax and I because it basically executes it perfectly every single time. And as you saw in the uh, Sarsabot versus Sarsabot finals, it just <laughs> does whatever the heck it wants and like you end up with like a you know really different outcome each time. So it's not good for reprodu reproducing the same results, even if you have the same seed. It just doesn't do it. Right. So, so uh, another thing with my bot is it's actually very easy to specify builds to. It would take me five minutes to change it from doing it's macro hydra against protoss to doing a one base roach all in to doing a three base roach max to doing any other composition or build you could think of um because i have made it so you can say this is the build you want to go for and eventually it's going to decide based on what it sees which path it likes right have you now that's a, a good point of like having a specific training partner for it have you done that a lot particularly for 
Sarsa bot, like get it to play specific types of bots, or even have you ever coded something for it to play against? Like if you knew you're going to be, let's say, Zealot Rust in the exact same way five times, would you ever code something to train it? I uh, so for for Zealot Rush, I actually had something already. Basically, it would what I what I do have, um, as you know, in the Sarsa model, uh, you feed it a bunch of different states, right? And um, compared to something that's let's say where you have functional approximation, where you can take uh, um, you know a large uh, like uh, continuous variables as as inputs. In the case of SARS and Q learning, you can only take um, fixed states, and the less you have, the better. So, for example, what I have to counter these examples, uh, like a Zealot Rush or a Zeta Proxy, I actually have a simple state variable called danger. You know, and that goes from <laughs> one, it's an integer, it's like danger one, danger two, two danger three, and goes to five. And so, basically, you know. When, it, when that sort of like indicates the level of danger that Sarsa bot is in. And so when you saw in the, um, in the probot, in the, in the, yeah, in the probots, when it, when, when it was like shouting, ah, and <laughs> yeah. it sort of, it sort of realized that's what we figured. And <laughs> there was a problem. And so at that point it would sort of, and that's what it's being trained on. Okay. So it knows, okay, danger is let's say level three. And then I, and then I train it over several hundred games and then, well, it loses if it loses all the games because it built more drones. Then, you know, it kind of starts realizing maybe I shouldn't build more drones. Maybe I should build more units, you know, or uh, or spine crawlers. You know, so those are all defenses that are uh, that can be built, um, you know, even at danger level zero. But it's less likely, you know, if you train it enough. So I didn't, in particular, train. Or like add specific um, hard-coded features. The only hard-coded thing I added was a worker defense, which I took out for the finals. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so that um, that was sort of like moot. Uh, worker defense had to be hard-coded because workers in my code do not count as army units or anything. They're like their own AI, and so they don't work well together. But going forward, they will. Um, and then. The other thing is where I would say I would ha I trained it specifically versus an opponent uh, that was Micro Machine because Micro Machine you know had a very very strong aggressive style that you basically couldn't find with any other Terran opponent um, because most of the other Terran bots would either like you know wait too long or not be aggressive enough or like come in at like five to six minutes like the typical stuff so it, it was trained against that and it would. Uh, it would be sort of greedy in the beginning, and that would never work out for uh, for him versus Micro Machine. So for the match against Micro Machine, I had to train a lot of games actually. And what it basically came up with as a solution wasn't really wasn't really optimal gameplay. It was really just abusing bugs. That's all it was doing. It, it knew that Micro Machine would fail uh, when you know it loses its tech uh, tech lab and stuff like that. And right. So it sounds actually kind of cool. <laughs> they yeah. knew that there was a bug and it. it's like I'm going to exploit it and just to give I want to give a little context of people who may not have the full vision or, or so just give everyone a context that um, Sarzabot and HJAX AI were both in ProBots uh, which is our, our artificial intelligence tournament custom bot tournament and uh, uh, Sarzabot made it to the, the grand finals and was defeated by what was that was what was the name Dimitro of the bot? bot. Dimitro, Dimitro Bot, Dimitro bot which is a bot that makes nothing but zealots. Uh, no gas, gets no gas, doesn't do anything else. It just makes zealots. Um, or actually, no, sorry, it also has a worker rush. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can I? It has a worker I? rush mode. And it has de defeated many bots through just worker rushing. Um, I, think I, Sars, I think Sars a bot lost one game to its worker yeah. rush. So um, it not being able to defend worker rush, which was mentioned earlier, uh, was a, a weakness. Yeah. Which stars uh, Dimitrova exploited in many a bots leading up to the grand finals. Uh, yeah, HX, what were you using? Uh, can, I, can I like briefly talk about Dimitrova's win? Yeah. Uh, is, is, so, is, there, is, there, is there something to like preface that? I'm, just, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not actually going to say anything critical sure. about Dimitrovot sure. at all. Right. I'm going to say that I think in a lot of the tournament formats that people have been using for these kind of things, surprises are overpowered 
And, yeah. and by that, I mean, so these bots don't learn throughout a series, um, yeah. at least for the most part. So in a best of one or a best of, I don't know, 85, right? It's more or less going to be a sweep, uh, especially if a bot shows up with a strategy that another bot hasn't been prepared for. So for instance, uh, HXAI against Mitra bot, it had a, a response against the, the build um, that it was doing the Zealot Rush, but it wasn't a good enough response. And HXAI had never played against that particular all-in before. So it just lost every single time to a strategy that was completely different from anything it had seen before. The same thing actually just happened in the latter tournament, which was won by Seabot, which I mentioned earlier. No one had ever done a two-base sky toss build before. So no one was prepared for it. So it just won almost, like, it was a well-executed strategy, but it got a lot of benefit from being a surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if, maybe maybe people are okay with surprises winning tournaments, but, like, at, at least my, my analysis is that surprises do very, very well. <laughs> I think there's a, there's a fun part, and, yeah. and funny that you mentioned it, because one thing we noticed when we'd done um, Sarzabot versus uh, Dimitrobot is that eventually, over the longer period of time, Sarzabot did, like, start to learn. But in the beginning, it did, like... It, but that's unique to Sarzabot, right? Yeah, Literally, yeah. none oh, of the absolutely. other bots in the tournament can do that. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, uh, and there, I think it was... No, actually, no, it would have been uh, Nike's bot then. Some bots do have continuous, like based on playing in series that they learn from what happened prior. Yeah, like, so, I remember. so oh, a few it? bots like Tier will have kind of like a book of yes, strategies. Yes, it was Tier. And they'll just yeah. flip through the book every time they lose. So they'll try the first strategy and they'll do it over and over and over again. And as soon as they lose once with it, they'll switch to the second strategy and, and so on, which is another kind of form of variance, but it's not like super interesting. It's kind of just like we're going to. There's not a lot of logic there. It's just we're going to switch through our strategies until we find one that hopefully works. And if none of them work, well, we're out of luck. Um, but like, I think just like surprises have done very well. So I don't know if you guys saw uh, the author of Dimitra bot talking about his bot in the Discord. That worker rush was a placeholder bot that he didn't expect to get very far. <laughs> so when yeah, we actually did an interview with him, and he actually yeah. mentioned that in when the he interview. made it to the quarterfinals, he said well, crap, I need to find something else my bot can do, but I can only change 25% of the code. So he made the Zealot Rush thing, which was completely different from anything his bot was doing before and won games. But it was a surprise. If you had told me, <laughs> if you had told me 20 minutes before the deadline that he was going to do that, I could have changed my bot to win 100% of the time against it. Yeah. But that kind of was the purpose. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. My, my, yeah, my yeah. Like that. I, I don't think it's, it's always going to be like that. When yeah, but the best of what was it? Best of eighty or something. Like that's actually a good example where I think Sarsabot would do a lot better, and that's why. I yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that that going forward, you know, we we will actually get more machine learning bots. I know, I, I know at least two people that are actively working on like machine learning, like competitive machine learning bots in our Discord. So I, I'm I'm really hopeful for the future of what it's going. Oh to yeah, be. for sure. I'm just saying right now that surprises seem to prevail over consistency. Yeah, it's weird. Which, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just a pattern. Yeah, it, it's the thing I've noticed over both seasons. There's the two extremes almost seem to perform the best, which is super cheesy surprise, easy to execute stuff, or generic hardcore macro. And I, nothing has done well with like a timing attack. Nothing has done well with like this composition gets built and then I go attack. Like it, that seems and, to be and always- two, And two, that's the whole thing defense too. There is a level of which you would imagine over time, a meta will, will appear of which authors will, you know, exa not exhaust the type of surprises, but will better create a baseline of which their certain surprises just won't be viable anymore. Yeah, because like obviously as the bots mature and like more features are added, it becomes harder to surprise them. Yes. Uh, yeah. But right now the the bots in the community is so young that like there's thousands, I'm sure, of random strategies you could cook up to win. Absolutely. A and then yeah. that's and really that's the uh, I think that's I think that's good because like to me I think yeah. as long as tournaments in the AI space are in for the long haul, there will be a, a progression. Just like if you think about the evolution of this of StarCraft, it like people versus people, you know, in the earlier Wings of Liberty, there were tons of things you could get away with that people would just 
you know die yeah, but over the, time the the difference between a, a person and a and a bot right if you if you if you zealot rush some dude he'll figure it out right he's absolutely gonna, he's gonna yeah. experiment more than at least most of the bots are currently capable of with i guess the notable exclusion of sarsa bot well the whole <laughs> idea the idea is that it, as opposed where it's people versus people per game they would change the it would have to be per tournament. The, the evolution of people changing and the evolution of the bots changing is is more of a, the skip and time span. Also, it's also based on technology too and, and bot authors and their abilities and stuff like that. But I don't want to get too digressed too far into it. So before we get back into it, let's reel it back. I want to tie, um, I want to show you guys and go over with you guys um, the stuff that was released at BlizzCon with DeepMind and get your interpretation of what's going on there and what it means for the general a you know starcraft 2 ai community so if we can uh do we have that ready to go uh tara let's uh take a look at that let's take a look at a little bit and uh, tara listen for me when i say for us to stop is there some points i'm going to want to stop on that more on like other aspects of the game uh, but first we wanted to get the release right right yeah i mean it must have been a really interesting two they can't hear us right like going from okay. the very no, first day trying to even approach the starcraft 2 problem from you're right you're right i do want to discuss it i do want to right so i i mean um, while this goes on sort of, um nike can you also drop me the link of your um Starts about explanation. Someone wanted it in chat. Um, I am, don't actually have my computer right now, but you can oh. just forward the. <laughs> I don't think we're actually muted on the stream, by the way. Video games for researching artificial intelligence. Yeah. And what's been super nice is that. Uh, is the audio uh, muted from the video? Difficulty. Uh, oh. Previously, oh. sort of successfully uh, declared, you know, soft games or at least yeah. been played at very high human level, right? So. Uh, we started with Atari, which there's like fairly simple old games, but it was still an impressive achievement when we did that um, three or four years ago. And then, as people might remember, two years ago we beat the world champion at Go. Um, but obviously, Go is a game where you, for instance, see the whole board, whereas in StarCraft yep. you you do have to go out and seek for information, right? So yeah. um, that aspect in particular is going to be one of the challenging things to deal with for <clears throat> the current AI technology. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious, because in a game like Go, there's 361 board positions, mm -hmm. so it's really clear what a move is. You just place the stone. But when it comes to something like StarCraft, I mean, what, how do you even define what an action is that a computer might want to take or that a player would want to take? Right, so for this, we took a very sort of human-centric approach, right? We look at how you play the game. I, I was a gamer back in the day. Actually, I played quite a bit of StarCraft uh, One, And we just kind of tried to emulate this idea of mouse clicks and keyboards clicks and dragging rectangles across the screen and so on. So when we defined wow. the API with Blizzard, we tried to really follow closely what someone playing with a keyboard and a mouse would look like. Can oh, we can we pause it right here like for a sec? Okay, so there's some interesting information brought here. The idea that um, limited actions versus like the different amount of actions from like Go versus chess versus StarCraft. Um, when you guys deal with the idea of um, the amount of information you have to gather um, in terms of a challenge, how do you guys how do you guys tackle that in terms of from a StarCraft perspective with your bots? Um, so I think it's important to make the the distinction between how yes bots that play chess play chess and how bots that play StarCraft play StarCraft. So in, in chess, you can do what's called a, a search approach where you sort of look at all your moves and then all the moves your opponent could do back and, and so on and so forth and sort of figure out the, the, the best worst case, the best way. Uh, so if you assume you make your best moves and your opponent makes their best moves, what's the best place you can end up for you? Uh, the StarCraft programs don't play like that. They play like, uh, I have some Marines. When I have 30 of them, I am going to attack his base. Uh, they don't sort of do that calculation ahead that uh, a lot of other games do. And that's kind of subverts the, the action space problem because StarCraft's action space is way, way, way too big to sort of say, what are all my moves? What are all my opponent's moves, right? They're basically infinite. Uh, but so you'd sort of end up thinking of things on a higher level 
with uh, at least the most of the bots right now are effectively decision trees, right? Mm -hmm. If this is true, do this thing. If this is true, do this other thing. When you have, well, in the case of my bot, when you hit 200 supply, or if you've lost less resources than your opponent, go kill them. Um, yeah. It's not a, a like computationally expensive thing to decide. Uh, whereas for for chess and, and go, or lesser for go, I guess, because Go's action space is big enough that programs still struggle with it. But at least for chess, where you can just say, look ahead as far as you can, and then try to get to the place that's best for you. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would agree. One thing to note is that chess, because, of, yeah, as HX said, the, the alpha beta pruning is so powerful. Uh, if, you, if you just throw resources at the chess problem, you're gonna do really well, you know, even against a grandmaster. Like anybody could, like nowadays, probably code a bot that has an elo of like two thousand, you know, over maybe a week or two. Like it's, uh, it's not too difficult to come up with something that's relatively solid, just because it's very, it's very well known nowadays how to tackle the chess problem. For StarCraft, there's just nothing like that. As HX said, you have an infinite state space, you have an infinite action space, or well, near infinite, and um, and it's and while you have that in chess as well, um, there's just no real precedent on how to go about it in uh, in StarCraft. You know, it's all asymmetric information. It's very different to go off of anything, and a lot of the actions you do at the very beginning only become very relevant at the very end. You know, whereas in in chess, you know, if you lose a pawn right at the beginning it becomes very clear very quickly that this is a bad idea, you know, and you can replay it <laughs> faster. Whereas in, in StarCraft, some things, you know, really become only relevant at the end. So it's just a different problem. It's a lot harder to formulate. And it, you know, I think, so, it's, I think it's very difficult. One, one way you can kind of think about it is in terms of, if you were to just make random moves. On a chessboard, there's very few moves. And if you make random moves, probably, I don't know, maybe a third of them, at any given point in time are reasonable moves. Maybe not the best move, but you know, maybe not bad ones either. In StarCraft, at the beginning of the game, how many of your legal moves do you think are good? Very, very, very few, right? Because most mm -hmm. of your moves are sending your workers all over the map, which yeah. isn't what you want to do. You want them to do one very specific thing, which is mine. And pretty much anything but that is going to lose you the game. Whereas in, in chess, you can make some some random moves sometimes you probably could still do okay um but in starcraft you just can't you'll lose so that and i think um dave we had mentioned this before it's the ability to almost sign, assign value to certain actions which kind of makes the starcraft problem a little harder because in chess you can say a pawn is worth one right if you lost it yeah yeah, it, it's eventually in yeah in the early days of chess they would just straight up tell it that because that's what people thought. Nowadays they let the chess AIs figure that out for themselves, but they actually come to similar values to what humans always thought that maybe instead of a bishop being worth three, it's worth like two point nine, and it changes over the duration of the game or something. But but yeah, we had approximate values of like this is worth this, this is important, this is better than this, whatever. But it also in chess, uh, as there's states, like there's board positions. And when you look into the future, even though you can't see to the end of the game, you can see that this series of actions will get me to a board position that is more favorable for me than my opponent. And it's because you could see everything on the board, you know how to evaluate that. And for computers nowadays, they know if they could get to seven or less pieces, then they know it from there. Like it's but just completely it, solved. Yeah. There's literally so, a database of all yeah. of all the if there's seven or less pieces on the board, you just look up in the database and it says, here's who went, here's who's winning and here's how to win. Exactly. So, so they know it's trying to say, so it evaluates where it is, what the value that is, and then it essentially is going to try and either simplify to that or end it before that. But in StarCraft, you guys mentioned that the asymmetrical information is a gigantic thing because it doesn't know what the board looks like. It's guessing, it can see what it can see, but it doesn't know. The, like you know what, the, the asymmetry isn't even the craziest problem. 
right now, honestly, like if you just think about um, production decisions, you know, as HX uh, lined it out, if you don't build a worker in the beginning, you know, and you decide, oh, I'm going to build like a depot instead, um, this is going to set you back. The, 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 yeah. And it's going to set you back massively because you're giving up like 8% of your economy and that's a cumulative effect that only becomes really apparent um, like six or seven minutes in when the opponent suddenly has a much bigger army than you. You know, it's extremely hard for any machine learning algorithm to say, to go back and say, oh, you know what, maybe I shouldn't have built that depot in like second 12, you know, because, right. because uh, recent actions are typically valued much, much more than actions going that far back. And that's, that's just a typical reinforcement learning problem that we have. It's very, very difficult to, you know, go back from the future and then say, okay, well, this is where I went wrong in like second 12. And on top of that, it's continuous. It's not like 30 moves ahead. It's literally like an infinite space time yeah. going forward. It's very difficult. Does that make yeah. it difficult for specifically for the bot to learn from its mistakes? It can't that... figure it can't figure out what the mistake is. And that's no. actually, it's actually true for human players in, in this game. <laughs> is, well, if you ever watch someone, true. some watch some random streamer or whatever and watch them rage, they're always going to blame like the last thing or two they did. They never go back and be like, oh, that thing I did nine minutes ago, that's where I lost the game when I didn't take my third on the right time. They end up losing to like, whatever uh, uh, brood lords and then they're like oh brood lords are fucking stupid but they lost you lost 10 minutes ago man you just didn't lose yet and so, that, I, that requires like an outside person right like yeah. an outside person to kind of point that out so that's interesting to think yeah. that a bot would yeah so if acquire. it doesn't know it, yeah so i think that's a really good example of if it, it made three depots right away when it could have made 12 workers and then it loses way later on it's not going to know it's because it started that bad unless it tries to not start that bad. Like it, it's very hard to attribute a single action to the result because it's such a long tree, right? So, so there are even a tree. with that in reinforcement learning, you know, which is I'm using something called uh, expected Sarsa Lambda, which you know builds a, a trace and sort of like makes sure that previous actions are also taken into account. But it is it is a very, very complicated problem because go the further you go back, the much, much harder it gets for you to determine that problem. You know, if you die like five or six minutes in, then the stuff you did in the beginning, the bot will not necessarily know if it's good or bad, you know. Like the best thing is actually getting rushed right at the beginning. Right. Uh, so that the bot figures out, you know, I actually need to build early defenses early on. Which is also incidentally why why, why I believe that deep mind uh, was uh, love the cannon rushes in the beginning because this way it learns very quickly yeah. how to how to build the right economy so it, it basically thinks like this by it's like by default if i end the game quicker i'm probably gonna win if it i imagine it probably comes to the conclusion uh, uh, um if there's anything i've learned from talking to ai researchers is if they can take a big game and make it smaller they love that because yeah. it makes it easier so if you can never mind gas which is something one of the bot developers in the discord has been adamant about he wants to beat everyone at starcraft without mining gas because then he just doesn't have to worry about all the gas units uh and it's if true. you can make the game smaller that means the game's easier so, so if for instance in cannon rushing you just throw out who, who cares about carriers or cannon right. rushing you don't have to learn about carriers because there's gonna be no carriers Yep, uh, you focus mainly on mineral. That's interesting. I, I, I wonder how Dimitro bot, if I didn't obviously Dimitro bot had a, a season hurry where it was a <laughs> half together bot at the last minute. But, you know, I wonder if making the game simpler played to his favor where he didn't have to worry about a level of decision tree that just wasn't there. Um, uh, I think so for sure, actually. Because another thing that's kind of true for bots, if you do something to your opponent before your opponent does something to you, you often win. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you assume that you aren't prepared for your opponent and your opponent isn't prepared for you, the guy who does his thing first is going to win. So cheesing is good, right? If you can cannon rush well, but can't defend Sky Toss, well, you're going to cannon rush before he gets to Sky Toss. So it doesn't matter. Sure. Okay. The, the, the trump and the trumping of the the cards in that regard. Yeah. Just yeah. beat him before he does the thing that beats you. My cheese before your cheese. Exactly.
but it's even true for human players, right? Like yeah. the late oh, game, yeah, sure, both dude. human players have problems with the late game, like trying to control vipers and you know infestors and broodlords, everything at the same time, splitting it. Like most people in Diamond don't even use infestors or vipers. You know, it's it's good enough to deal without those units, and then. The next stage is to add those to your repertoire and then you become masters and then eventually you've got the micro fully done and then you grandmaster, you know? So it's yeah. it's sort of like true across all levels, even for humans and bots. You know, the later the game goes, the harder it is to play. So and the more specific it gets, like a lot of casters have commented in human games of like, if someone plays a weird style or has this like super late game sort of thing, whether it's like in a velo with mass ravens or like, you get into one of these crazy Viper Broodlord Investor games or like the Neeb Mass Oracle Carrier Tempest, like whatever thing, you get that and the opponent that you're playing may have only faced that twice in their life and you do that every game. So you're just going to win based on pure experience, whether you're better or not sometimes. So another way to sort of look at it, if you think about all the players who have been known for having good late game, they are almost universally considered amazing defensive players. Yeah. Because the only way you get good at late game is by being good at surviving the late game. And doing that is hard. And canyon rushing doesn't have to worry about that. <laughs> Haas players, beware. Um, one of the things I was curious about in terms, especially for Sarsabot, when it comes to the problems, is it possible that just consuming more replays giving it that opportunity to learn from those mistakes or i guess even not even like situations and scenarios cannot help towards solving problems um no they definitely can like i'm actually not using replays and it's a huge um huge disadvantage um i basically i have very little time unfortunately to work on on the bot things and you know, absorbing the replays and going through the replays and using that information, you know, to feed into my um, into my, my training data that would make a lot would make a lot of sense and would be very useful. I'm not using it right now. So right now, all the training is generated in like an online sort of fashion, where uh, with online I mean, you know, it's it's playing live versus other bots. But it's learning on the fly as opposed to consuming as much data as possible. Um. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, would, I would say that it, it currently learns by playing rather, rather than yeah. learns by watching. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we kind of touched on it there, but like, is there, or has anyone on the StarCraft AI ladder or have you guys considered just making a bot that is excessively defensive that learns, yeah. Just, just, that, that just, like, just starts the game off with like I'm making six spine crawlers, four spore crawlers. Fuck you, all macro from there. I mean, I mean, like, I've actually sort of made adjustments to my bot in tournaments based on the opponent rate. Uh, so, for instance, if I'm uh, in the latter tournament, I was in a bunch of uh, I was in a group with a bunch of Protoss players. So I changed my code from if you think there's DTs or air, build spore crawlers to build spore crawlers. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, none of these Protoss bots, as far as I'm aware, can beat me in a macro game. And they're right. still not going to beat me if I build spore crawlers. Um, and then I still died to, to carriers, but you know, I didn't. <laughs> so it's, it's really weird. I did actually like, uh, I know that HX hated it, but I did actually like the ladder tournament format where you only can submit once. And, you know, that, that's it. It goes to the finals like this. And if, if you do, let's say, weekly resubmission, then what you end up doing is you sort of end up sniping your opponent, sort of like end up like implementing very specific strategies against that opponent. And I, I did actually enjoy the part, even though my bot mostly cheesed, like, unfortunately, but I did enjoy the part that it, um, you know, that it still had the ability or that it would have had the ability to adapt, you know. But yeah, for scripted bot, that's not a good idea. I agree. Yeah. Um, the thing is, since it was a it was a ladder tournament, right? So we we the the qualification was through a ladder, um, and then we submitted our final bots for the tournament. The issue was there was no rule that said the bot you submitted for the tournament had to look anything at all like the bot that played right. on ladder. In the ladder. <laughs> yeah. In bot's case, it might as well have been a completely new bot because it did nothing that the other C bot did. The other C bot played either like a one base plus one zealot all in 
or like macro colossus, right? And this was doing a two base carrier all in. Completely unique, different strategy, but like you're not prepared. It might as well have been a completely different bot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, it, it did well because it was a surprise. And I don't necessarily have always have issues with um like no no resubmissions because it does, you know, favor bots that can adapt, but it just also happens to favor surprises. And the tournament was won by a big surprise. And I, I think Nike would also agree with me that the Sarsa bot won its group with another surprise, which was a proxy match yeah, build. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I do, on, on that side, I want to say I do believe that uh, AIC's bot um, had more than just the, um, you know, two base carrier rush, um, because it did also manage to defend really well, I have to say. You know, I was actually surprised by that. Like it ended up, the finals ended up being 3-2 in his favor. Um, and that's only because he managed to really like defend the uh, the cheese very well, I have to say. So he did put a lot of effort into defending and then getting into the late game, which is what we discussed previously. You know, so his bot, you know, even though we didn't see a lot of it, it was probably very very good at defending and to get into the late game. And then in the late game, he had the superiority, you know, versus everything else. Was is that bot a scripted bot or a machine learning bot? Scripted. This one is a scripted bot. It was it, also like a, a sort of unfortunate thing that happened that wasn't the author's fault at all. In fact, I don't think he was even aware or intended it, but he uh, hard walled his natural, like completely <laughs> walled his natural. And a lot of bots just kind of a move at the enemy's main base. And <laughs> wall yeah. sometimes the units don't go the right way so there's yeah. actually a lot of games against the uh, seabot where an army would just get stuck like standing next to the main trying to get in because it wouldn't <laughs> right, right, right. fight its way up the ramp um and Did that block off vision like how come were they just unable to see the what so blocked in, in the in the starcraft engine if there's no path to where you're trying to go they'll walk to the closest point yeah. oh and so if you imagine i don't know um like on blue shift, uh, if the if the natural's walled off on blue shift, the closest point isn't the natural. It's the line it's distance, basically. Yeah, so it'll it'll walk. You you say go kill his main, and your army goes and sits in his third and goes. This was as close as we could get to his main, <laughs> um, which was really unfortunate, and it led to a really large number of very disappointing to look at games, right? Where an art like a bot would make an army and just couldn't fight with it because it couldn't figure out how to get to its opponent's base. And there hadn't really been any boss that walled off like this before. So a lot of boss just died. And that's so right. that's the kind of thing that makes me want to like favor resubmission because people- how, does a, how would a machine learning bot deal with a scenario like that? So, I mean, well, Sarsa bot died too. <laughs> it, it, played against it, and it, it died against that whenever it got to that point because it couldn't get inside. It had, in that one scenario that I remember, it had about 95 Zerglings and, and the opponent had four cannons and four um, shield batteries and nothing else. So he would have definitely broken the wall and gotten in, but he couldn't, like, it was impossible to get through the wall because the bot got stuck somewhere completely else due to pathing. So Sarsa bot wouldn't have that figured that out because this particular instance, um, it's using, or Sarsa bot is using these convenience functions, you know? It would say attack main or attack second main or attack, uh, which would be the expansion or attack unguarded expansion, you know? So it has all these convenience actions that it would use, but that it would always only point right at the, um, at, at the nexus and not at, oh, you know, yeah. go to the wall first and then go there. So that's why it just got completely stuck despite the decisions being the right ones, you know, producing units, trying to break the wall, and then macroing up. But it just didn't, you know. Is that a solvable problem? Or is that like it's, something that like. Yeah, Seeker had asked in chat here a little while ago, uh, like, is there a way to kind of program in a plan B? It, like a way that it can detect that something is failing and then give it a backup or a route? We've I seen mean, like. The, it, the closest thing anyone's done is the the tier thing, right? Where you just. Have your have your big book of builds and you go uh build one didn't work let's try build two ah build two didn't work let's try build three. Ooh, build three worked let's do it again but in the case of my army can't find his base it probably yeah. doesn't matter what build you're doing because no matter what army well, you're not yeah let's go into build state but to be like I, I i don't know whether it's like a timeout thing or we like we've seen also with uh 
things get hard set on like, I'm putting a hatchery at the natural, it dies. I'm putting a hatchery at the natural, it dies. I'm putting a hatchery, yeah, like they do that. And there seems no way out of that loop. Is there anything that can be put in to basically say, I was trying to go to the main and I can't seem to get there. So at some point I'm going to abandon that plan or at I mean, some point I'm going to do something else. If you have a way to, to keep track of failures, right? So it's probably easier to fix that for the drone building the hatch, right? Because you say, I made a drone. I told it to go build a hatchery. It died. Huh. Maybe I should try a different base or maybe I should build a bunch of army units and go clear out that base first. But how do you know that your lings can't get to his base? They're trying. Yeah. yeah. They're not, they're, they're, they're still trying. Well, they're, they're <laughs> still trying. They're in the third base, but they're trying. In fact, they're, they're crunching themselves up against the wall as if it could get them into the main base, but they're trying. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, so I, it, can't, I, it can't distinguish like yeah, failure you, versus you could, it like, trying. Try your progress, like distance from the main now, distance from the main 10 seconds from now, did we get closer? Maybe that works. But even if you know that you failed, you don't know why. I just consider that a real sort of like bug in, in our own code. It's not AIC's fault. It's, uh, yeah, it's yeah, it, it, I don't blame him for that at all because I don't it, think he knew. It's the pathing path that went wrong for all the bots. It's a little bit like saying, okay, you know, I have Zerglings and they're trying to attack a Mutalisk and well, it just doesn't work out. You know, it's like for scripted bots, they should know that they cannot attack air. And for machine learning bots, they would eventually figure out that there's no point in trying to attack a Mutalisk with a Zergling because it can't reach it, right? Uh, so getting through the wall, it just isn't possible because the convenience function that says attack the opponent, it just doesn't work as, as HX says. Like there's nothing we could have done to fix that like in a machine learning way or even in a scripted way at that point in time, unless you actually allow resubmission. Yeah. Cause... Okay, but you could like, if given the opportunity, you would have been able yeah. to. Now so, that so, you, so, yeah, like now that you know that that can so, happen, presumably absolutely. there's a way around it. Yeah. A, a, a quick fix would be instead of attacking your opponent's main, attack the structure that is closest to you. Yeah. Because that um, will probably make it go for the wall before the main. Um, and something like that would, would fix it. But it's just kind of the developers trusted StarCraft to send the army the right way when you attack <laughs> never, them. Never do that. Yeah. Then, I then wouldn't then do that StarCraft, even as a human. Yeah. StarCraft works in a very specific way. And StarCraft did the thing that no one wanted it to do, which was send the army to the corner of the map, basically. So, <laughs> the, Is there uh, a way, I've noticed too, like the way that a few of the different bots move is actually different. Like that some do that of like, and I guess it's this convenience function you mentioned, they just set in a course and they go to that course. Other ones seem that on every single unit, instead of picking a faraway spot, it clicks 10,000 times between the spot. Mm -hmm. Like, so, is, is that just a method? So the thing? issue with that is, different? so yeah. the ones that click a thousand times are probably doing something like measuring distance between their, their individual units and the target through some method and updating it every now and again. Uh, do you know what the distance is between a unit and the nexus that's behind the wall that you can't get to? The distance is zero. We're already there. Yeah. Um, which means that those bots are also going to be very sad when they try to walk to the main. They'll do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, um, because there's actually, as far as I'm aware, no way to tell StarCraft to ignore buildings. But... StarCraft does give you the, the pathing grid, the thing that is used to decide moves. So if you were to make a copy of that at the start of the game before anything's built and use that for all your decisions, then it would work, right? If you, if you take a snapshot of the map at the beginning of the game yeah. and how, how pathing worked then, then if you move to the main, it would go the right way. But that's just a lot of sort of extra work. So yeah, we just so get oh, give people just I'm like sorry, a, Nick, you. you're about to get cheesed out. <laughs> just to like a, a give, give give people an idea of what we're all talking about here. So here's like a video of just stars about an HX AI. I think this yeah. was actually from the tournament. Uh, oh, so, um, so yeah, HX AI didn't have ZVZ. Uh, so I told it to link flip because there weren't any good Zerg bots at the time when I was writing at CVZ. In yeah. fact, it was the only... Actually, Tara, why don't you increase the speed too so we don't have to go through the full... 
Um, so no, it is I told it to link flood, and that's that's what it does. My new bot actually plays like macro rich CVZ, and will make one game. I, I just want to say that's my only loss, okay, in that yes. in that group. <laughs> You're welcome. That's true. That's true. I actually felt bad because I think your bot's like really interesting and that cheese is really boring. So just to give people um, an idea, because I know if we do do this as like an audio component, you guys will not be able to see the video. So so if this becomes a podcast, people are like, what are you watching? Um, <laughs> well, then, they, then they can go find the bot of this game. And, you know, it's, it's true. Get more, they get more engaged. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. Oh, you know what? Uh, you know, this may not have been played on stream. So yeah, this may have been I like. I don't a, think this game was casted because. Yeah, this would have. Been, this game would have been a game that was in the pool. I think it would have yeah. been in a, a pool. Fun fact: Cyril did this build a rogue at BlizzCon, and uh, <laughs> it was the only game Cyril lost to rogue. Nice. What was the build? So that it was. It was four, fourteen hatch, fourteen gas, fourteen pools. So all before Overlord into a lane flip. So you're basically getting the quickest hatch and uh, zergling speed by basically building everything before you have to spend the 100 minerals on your overlord. And you end up with a lot of lings very quickly. And it's hard to stop. <laughs> and I really like this. So this is a good example of what AI can do for anyone that hasn't seen it. But this ling spread out. Is, oh, that's a bug. Like it just scoured the map. Like, <laughs> why, 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 did, yeah, why did it do this? Uh, HXAI has a bug where it doesn't remember where its opponent spawned at the start of the game. So <laughs> okay. it, it says, I don't know where Sarsabot is. I need to go look for it. Yeah. So then it goes and looks for it, and then it finds yeah. it and sends all the links there. Uh, yeah. I fixed that bug in my new bot, so it doesn't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised the... Sarsabot took, took a third base at like two minutes something. I think, no, this was in the group stage. This was before this you had the group. ML. Yeah. So... Yeah. While we're going this, I want to still kind of kill some of our main questions here. So what are some of like the, the key challenges? Actually, why don't we talk about like, the difference between what you guys do and what Alphabot, I mean, so with Alpha, um, DeepMind. DeepMind. DeepMind doesn't have a name for their StarCraft bot yet. Yeah, not yet. It's kind of inconvenient. They should name it something. I they think it's probably. iterative, right? Because they've already changed, like Alpha Zero was their chess bot, but now it's called like Lila Zero. Or something. Uh, so like, I think it's Lila, based on Lila the generation. Made by other people. Okay. Uh, it's sort of a, a community project to replicate what, what DeepMind did. Uh, okay. Because they're saying this was really cool, and DeepMind didn't give out their stuff after. They kept it secret, but they gave us a paper. So we're going to oh, just okay. do what the paper says and see if we can replicate it. And they've been very successful. Didn't they, didn't they, re they didn't release, I thought they released some of their stuff. Or is this, no, this is specifically. For, for Alpha Go and Alpha Zero. Oh, Alpha Go and Alpha Zero. Papers. They didn't release source code or training data. So. Yeah. People have replicated it. Uh, what about in StarCraft cool. 2? Or have they released that kind of source code as well? Or is it still they released papers? the library that there was the the PySC2 library, which is just yes. sort of repackaging yes. StarCraft into a format a computer might be able to understand a little bit better. But that has nothing to do with the training. So what they released yeah, again is, is papers, you know, where they sort of described how they solved some of their initial efforts, like the mini games, you know, mini games in that context, meaning um, like a small game where you have marines and you have to defeat banelings or roaches. Actually, speaking of which, actually, can we go into the back into the uh, BlizzCon things? They talk about the mini games. So let's. All right. So explain to the people at home about mini games while Tara looks up for that that part. Well, the idea is that you um, you split again. The game of Stackford is very very complex, right? So. By splitting the whole uh, problem, by bootstrapping it into lots of smaller little problems, the idea is that if you find a good solution that sort of handles all these smaller problems, then you can eventually uh, put all these like pieces together and find a really good solution for the overall problem. Um, I think that's the idea, at least. So the mini games that uh, DeepMind came up with is stuff like, OK, we have like 10 Marines. We have to evade five banelings. And, you know, let's try to do that with the least amount of losses or in the most effective way or in the fastest way or a combination thereof, you know, and you have like roaches versus paintings or just collecting mineral shards, uh, things like that. Those are like really good, simple examples where, uh, you know, DeepMind came up with efficient, um, unsupervised machine learning algorithms to, you know, just based on the pixels, basically, and figuring out what to do. So that's, that's already very impressive. But keep in mind that each of these uh, games took them over 600 million frames 
to train, you know, something very, very simple. And, you know, even with my computing power where maybe I get like up to 10 frames per second, that's a very, very uh, difficult task to achieve, you know, for anyone that just doesn't have the computing power available. So they, they, they do have a lot of computing power, but they also have, you know, a good way of going about it by like having a small problem and building up those components modularized to fit into a larger image. Okay, let's get let's, let's get let the people see a little bit about this. Why don't you show us, Tara? Right. So, as I was saying, um, <laughs> the first things we kind of did and open sourced um, was these mini games, which were kind of pieces of StarCraft, really, that any player should kind of master. Right. So, so this is simple things like moving units around, moving groups of units around, also dealing with economy, like so building buildings to mine more minerals or building uh, as large an army as you can in a li limited time span. And the release, we actually have gone quite uh, far in these mini games and we have essentially achieved what I would call very competent human performance, like yeah. maybe grandmaster level or so, but there are ob 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 obviously extremely limited um, sets of yeah. things in StarCraft, right? And is this to just get a feel for it to make sure right. that the, you know, the framework that you're functioning with is causing proper learning to happen? Exactly, so we learned a lot, right? A lot of the difficulties of the action space, the mouse clicks um, was exposed thanks to this. Um, and so it was a, bad, a very good first stepping stone. And also for the community, it's a bit- So we can just pause it there. Um, so those mini games are essentially like released to the community and people can play at them. Yeah, you can even create your own mini games. I mean, in my training that I use for, uh, for the, like the new micro module that I'm working on, um, I just created various different mini games like Mutalisk versus Arch Ar Archons, I guess, um, or like Roaches versus Immortals with Zerglings. You know, so the idea is that you know, the Roaches pull back, the Zerglings defeat the Immortals, and then the Roaches come in. Stuff like that. You can create all kinds of mini games yourself, trying to like beat a certain ob objective. You know, and do you, and and have do most of the bots in the community like. I remember, I don't know if there's, this was true or how it works, that there used to be a prize for someone who can defeat some of the, the most difficult mini games, or was that something that... Um, so there was a prize to create something that learned to beat one of the mini games, or to, to make available a process that could produce an agent that could do that. And as far as I'm aware, no one actually claimed that prize because it was a hard problem. Um, and it was, I think it was to, to uh, it was a marine split thing, right? Pretty sure. I think it was just split, yeah, marine splitting. But like, um, um, so the prize was to come up with some process that would teach an agent to do. The, oh, that was that was that was the and, requirements. Yeah, and if you could if you could demonstrate that you had created such a process, you would win the prize. What was the prize? Do you remember what the prize was? It was one bitcoin. Yes, yes, I remember it. One bitcoin. And Which as far as I'm aware, no one actually beat the challenge <laughs> if i remember correctly it was like a team a bot an author team that had put up the, the it, prize it was, it was i think it was titan ex1 which is a, a starcraft team that employs programmers to generate data so they can do ai stuff that's really clever <laughs> like as a team you're like the team is actually up front so we can collect data for our bots yeah yeah it's it's sort of a give take relationship i guess with the players right you get a sponsor you just have to do a little work and help us on the side what's the name of the team again titan x1 titan x1 well, uh, they don't they, want anything they, they have... so apparently someone from gsl is in that is on that team so hmm, that's kind of clever and cool they at the same time forte did not know leenock a lot well, leenock forte and Impact. wow that's actually like well, Life that's actually like legit people <laughs> yeah yeah like top korean pros oh that's clever and cool at the same time wow um today i learned uh so what are some of the what are some of the misconceptions that most people have about when you get about working on ai that you've encountered uh i think it was from it is something like the biggest problem with AI is that people think they understand it. I think it was the recent quote I read. Uh, it, <laughs> they, they basically, a lot of people expect wonders, um, you know? So for example, I think Sarsa bot, the original Sarsa bot that played in the ProBus tournament was a good example. You know, the production decisions are all 
based on you know just pure like reinforcement learning but you know then sarsabot loses because it does like build a pool 30 seconds too late or something like that and then people are like easily oh well it sucks you know so the problem <laughs> the problem that really is that things that seem seem mundane to most people are actually very difficult to achieve with reinforcement learning just because it's so easy to script them you know so that's sort of like the challenge i'm uh, i'm facing when when you do reinforcement learning that a lot of things that really are very difficult to achieve are like would actually be really easy to put in place if you would just script certain things you know uh hx will be yourself um yeah, I think a lot of people also think that it's sort of this like magic thing where you just like throw AI at the problem and get good results back, which isn't true. Uh, you like start, for instance, StarCraft's hard, right? So it's it's really a sort of new pro problem for, for AI and machine learning. So people are were expecting like this genius thing to come out. It's just like, yeah, you can you can do it. Look, they did it with chess. Why can't they do it with StarCraft? It's the same thing, but it mm -hmm. isn't. So yeah, I, I think understanding. That, yeah, go ahead. I think understanding what AI is capable of uh, and like how difficult it is to apply to like new domains, something that people don't always understand. Now, extending that, I, I know a lot of people have asked me why is StarCraft apparently so much harder compared to Dota? So in Dota 2, uh, there is successful AI. Do you guys know anything about what the difference in terms of complexity of the two games would be or what what right. makes one a lot so harder than the other? I, I followed the, the OpenAI 5 stuff really closely because I think all this stuff is really cool. Yeah. Um, so in, in Dota, you have five things to control. One hero per, per person. Um, and that is all you can actually interact with in the game. Um, whereas in, in StarCraft, like an Oracle is, is almost as complex, not, not quite as complex, but close enough to, to being by the heroes in Dota. Um, one thing that I think they kind of cheated on with OpenAI 5, and they didn't actually mention it. And in fact, they, they said things that seemed to be phrased in a way to hide it. They talk about how each of their programs, each of their heroes did not communicate with each other, just, or, um, like, they, they ran separately, I guess is a better way to put it. They weren't one program controlling five mm -hmm. things. It was, it was five, five agents, controlling five, five separate agents. But these agents were identical to each other. They were, right. so I don't need to tell you what I'm going to do if you're my clone and you know what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> so th th there was no communication because communication was implicit because they were clones of each other um so it kind of solved the the teamwork issue in dota by removing the teamwork issue right. in dota. so I, yeah I, I don't think it's necessarily true i actually think it's almost harder to work with clones i i can give you a direct example from from my current work on um on training the micro ai if you have several units working together um you know so if, if each of the units has their own sort of like AI, they, they tend to, um, you know, they, they tend to want to survive each of them, uh, but they, they often forget about the greater good and that is sacrificing themselves to achieve victory. Um, and that, that is often the case, for example, when like you have Zerglings versus Banelings, and well, some of the Zerglings just have to, you know, die versus the Banelings, and that's a good result. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, just infinitely running away from it or um or basically dying prematurely doesn't doesn't help so it's actually a very very difficult problem to get the units to um to work in a team but with the same uh but using exactly the same approach so that's exactly what i'm doing i'm using my ai is like or my reinforcement learning approach is uh, is using a clone for each unit type of its own um, of its own algorithm, but they need to work together, and that is actually a very very complicated problem to achieve. And I think it's actually easier if you have sort of like an, a master AI that tells each unit, well, now you should all attack together on that one 
you know, unit, or in the case of Dota, I would say now you all attack together this one enemy hero. I actually think it's more difficult. So, or it can tell one of them to be like, you should die in so that the rest may live. Yes, exactly. So Open, OpenAI actually had a solve for this, and SKJB in the chat mentioned it, and I, I was going to bring it up, which was uh, a, a value they called Team Spirit which is was a percentage of rewards that were given to your teammates. So for instance, every time OpenAI 5, one of its heroes gets gold, gets a kill, whatever, uh, it gets a reward, it gets a cookie. Um, and the, the uh, team spirit variable, if it's set to zero, you don't care about your teammates' rewards because you don't get any of the cookie. If it's set to 0.5, if, you're a, if one of your... Um, teammates gets a kill, you get half a kill. So you feel kind of good and you're rewarded for your teammate getting a kill. If it's, oh. set to one, if it's set to one, your teammates get rewarded for everything you do as much as if you did it. <clears throat> so even though they're, they're clones of each other, they're, they become selfless. They know if I die, but I know that two of my teammates are gonna get kills from it. It's positive because they don't actually um, selfishly view their own rewards because they're getting rewards from their friends. So that was how open. That's an AI interesting kind of like it's almost like when players pay each other, and they also get like like exp for other people's kills, like for as a support player, and you know they may get also. Here. It's just heroes of the storm. <laughs> I think, think that's it is way. just heroes of the storm. Oh my god, it is heroes. It's communist Dota again. Communist, communist Dota. Oh my god. This is terrible. I, I think I think that's the only way to do it. To be honest, you know, I have a similar variable. Not, it's not called team spirit, but like, yeah, basically, the idea is that even after the units are dead, um, the new rewards that keep on coming in are still accounted towards the old actions of the dead units. So, in a way, it gives them, you know, the the team spirit required. But I still believe it's a harder problem than if you had like one additional sort of AI that tells everybody, okay, now everybody do that and now everybody do that. I think, or maybe maybe it's not hard, maybe it's just a different problem. I just think in StarCraft 2, it is very difficult to achieve that. If yeah. it's, uh, just to delve into this further, if they're complete clones, doesn't it solve the thing? Like, instead of telling them what to do, they all know exactly what they're gonna do, right? Like in a game like Dota, where you can see exactly what your teammates can see, don't I know I'm Sniper, you're whatever a Dota character is. Uh, <laughs> Titan, whatever. whatever. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're, gyrocopter. you're the other guy. <laughs> yeah, you're a gyrocopter. And then don't I know from the exact information, like I, I could see everything the gyrocopter could see, so I know exactly what it's going to do because it's exactly what I would do. Yes. So don't, aren't they, yeah, like that's the idea, and right? So th that's what I was saying. They kind of, it, it's still yeah. obviously a hard problem, but it at least yeah. felt to me like they sort of, a lot of the difficulty in Dota is teamwork and, and mm. like making good decisions with limited information about what your teammates are going to do. But OpenAI5 doesn't have that problem because it knows what its it, teammates it are is, going to do. It is, I am the team. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 okay. For instance, but, it, but it was really good at taking team fights because there was no indecision ever. Because if one of the bots wanted to take a team fight, they all wanted to take a team fight, and they would all go in. <laughs> but it's not that simple. That's that's what bots are being trained on. It's not like oh, one bot wants to do it, so all of them want to do it because all of them have their own personality in a way. So yeah. this training variable that you call team spirit. It needs to be trained a lot so that all of them know well when this sort of like certain set of circumstances is happening then it becomes slightly more optimal to engage an, uh, an enemy together and because i know that the other boss think in a similar way then we engage together but right. if you don't so, train it with that variable it's going to get very very difficult and it's all, even that training process is very very demanding right. so, I, wanna... so I think my, my my point is more as far as i'm aware all the bots have the same set of weights uh, on the same team. They, they aren't trained separately. They are trained together. And I think it would have been more interesting for the Dota problem had there been Training. a pool of different agents that had to learn to work together. Maybe let's say you have 20 different agents that, that learn maybe separately and together. So then you, you end up having to have actual sort of teamwork where you don't actually know who your teammates are because they're not clones of you. They were trained 
separately. Maybe some of the games they were trained with you, but some of them they weren't. And I, I think that that would have made the, the Dota problem harder and more sort of yeah. true. So to this is, it also would have been more realistic because what really took me out of the open AI five games is that four of the teammates were not telling the other team to report and ban the fifth guy. <laughs> <laughs> and that always should happen. So my, my question is then, how does this tie back in terms of difficulty? Is StarCraft a def, like infinitely more difficult problem than Dota 2 in terms of solving it through the AI so agent? The, the, the action space for StarCraft is bigger than Dota. So in, yes. in Dota, each player has one hero. Each hero has four abilities and can auto attack and can move. So sure it's still infinite because it's sort of a continuous space where you can walk around the map but the yes. individual decisions that you make on a given at a given point in time are, are much narrower right if you for instance make a random move in dota maybe you'll kill some creeps and get some you know you'll you'll attack some more random on the map maybe you'll die to a tower and learn maybe i shouldn't go near towers maybe you'll you'll walk up a lane kill a creep get some gold and go ah that was pretty good i should do more of that uh is hard to make work in StarCraft because like I was saying before, if you do something random in StarCraft, most of the time it's sending your workers somewhere horrible on the map. Yeah. Um, it isn't even going to attack the enemy's base because it doesn't know what the enemy's base is. So I think in terms of exploring Dota, it's a little bit easier because uh, their OpenAI 5's framework was very greedy as far as I could tell. It really liked short-term rewards like killing something and getting a bit of gold. And that was really visible because it would use its ultimate abilities on creep waves because that would give it, yeah. get it some gold oh, right yeah. now. Uh, oh, but then I when it played against the pros. Really hmm? I think that's a really good argument. I, when you compare StarCraft 2 versus Dota, uh, is the reward. kind of like tic-tac-toe versus chess. <laughs> Yeah, it's the reward distance. Well, I think that's what you're getting at. Is yeah, because it's, it's very... Gold, more it's gold like is always Dota. good. Yeah, more XP and more gold is always good in yeah. Dota. And Whereas in StarCraft, I have to decide if I do... Uh, so I got minerals. Do I want to spend them? Do I want to keep them? What do I spend them on? That's a totally different problem. Right, so, so yeah. doing random stuff in Dota will get you rewards. And yeah. then you do some training that says, you know, I did some random stuff. I killed something, a creep somewhere on the map. That was good. Let's do more of that. In StarCraft, how do you know what was good? Because there's no there's no definitive way to say if you're winning or losing in a game of StarCraft. Maybe building a big army is good, but it isn't good if you're doing it on two bases. Oh, and the has the rest of the map. If you only build Zerglings and the opponent walls in and builds carriers, for example, then <laughs> that's a pretty bad strategy. So, but but in theory, it would be good because each unit you build, you know, gives you a certain reward. And so a machine learning AI could potentially learn this. So and it's very so you have to assign that reward or it has to figure out the reward and that dip, that presents the difficulty. I want to make sure I grasp that, right? Is that how we right, kind of right. are able so to it, view it? It's much easier in a game like Dota to give yourself, to find concrete ways to give your bot it. Uh, okay, because in Dota, pretty much anything you do could be considered a reward. It's essentially so linear. It's, like, it's, even it's, Dota. Reward, it's yeah. like, so for instance, where's a good place on the map to be in Dota? in lane in front of your tower killing creeps usually is something reasonable to be doing in dota and it's very easy for a bot to accidentally discover that to accidentally send its hero in front of its tower and kill creeps right it'll, if it a moves around and the map long enough it'll find it and even if it does nothing it's standing there gains at xp yeah. yes yeah because yeah, it'll it. yeah but in, in starcraft besides killing your opponent's buildings right what what is good? It depends what your opponent's doing. Oh, there's wow. There's no concrete Shit. way. Yeah. So, for instance, uh, there's a score structure in StarCraft, right? By mining resources, by building tech, by building army units, you get score. Um, so if you were to create an agent that only cared about getting lots of score at the end of the game. Oh, my God. <laughs> would it win? All sorts of random no, shit. Because you can get a lot of score and lose. <laughs> in fact, score isn't necessarily correlated to to winning at all. Because or or, best or way actually, to, hmm? to expand on that, DeepMind in their paper they 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 actually had exactly that problem that when they were training their AIs, 
the one surefire way of not losing for the Terran opponent was to lift the building and fly into the corner of the map, which is something <laughs> they, they found out. So, so the bots basically learned, oh, well, if I fly in the corner, I don't lose. And that, that was a strategy. But that doesn't, you know, it stops him from losing, but it won't make him win. What a difficult uh, problem to, to wrap one's mind. I really like that we got into this open AI. So I think it really... Yeah, I also think... Line. There's other things too. I think that Dota as a game compared to StarCraft II. StarCraft II, you can obviously benefit from having perfect micro and stuff. And we've seen some good examples of that. But in Dota 2, perfect micro is much more important. So if you know that every hit that you try is a last hit, then you get, you, you like an AI should theoretically miss no creeps. Ever. Because it knows the math, right? it knows when to fire. A human has to decide. And, and it should never get hit by like a directional alt. It should never get hit. It should never be too close together that it gets caught in a black hole or whatever. Like it should know things that are just mathematically true. Yes. And that's so, less true in StarCraft. There was actually examples of that in the OpenAI 5 matches. So there's a hero called Tidehunter. And Tidehunter's ultimate is a big area of effect, stun and damage for the enemy team. So if you have an ability that has a windup that does a lot of damage, for instance, for instance, gyrocopters ultimate, or hmm, maybe not even gyrocopter. Anyway, if you have a if you have an ability that has a um, a long windup, if it notices you're using that ability and it procs the the stun instantly, it'll yeah. it'll just stop you. <laughs> and what the human players were discovering were that some things just didn't work because you would do it and it would instantly do the thing that stops it. Like it knows, it should yeah, know. It, it just knows for a fact. Say, You're doing this, ah, I have the counter and I have that counter. I think it, they were running it like what, five times a second and had 200 millisecond delay on its actions. Yeah. So 200 milliseconds is still faster than a human would realistically be able to come up with a counter. Um, and that was actually something, I don't remember if they mentioned it, but it was kind of, AI, uh, sort of an AI problem. So humans react at a certain speed, right? But the speed at which humans react depends on the situation. If I tell you, your screen is gonna turn green, click on it as soon as it does. You can react in 200 milliseconds on average, maybe a little slower. If, I, if you're playing a game of Dota and you're focused on farming and someone blinks out of the woods on top of you, are you going to be able to react in time to hit that button when you weren't expecting it? No. But the bot will. And because the bot always had a 200 millisecond reaction time, in some situations, it was inhumanly fast. <laughs> it can't be surprised. It will react the same no matter how surprising something you did is. I just had like a flash of like judgment day and like a helicopter bot just like seeing instantaneous. So an another <laughs> sort of uh, instance of that was there's uh, the smoke of deceit, which cloaks your entire team, makes them invisible. Yeah. Teams would try to be invisible and pounce on, on Tidehunter, which has this stun, but they discovered the moment they uncloaked before they could even touch the Tidehunter, the it Tidehunter knew. would stun the whole team because the surprise has no effect on the computer like it would against the <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was pretty entertaining. It was kind of an issue that they didn't seem to have solved at all. They just kind of put a strict, I think it was 200 milliseconds latency on the bot, but that just meant. I think that just shows how, how strong or like something like doing micro decisions or micro like that is a lot easier for a computer for even for reinforcement learning AI, like in, in the, you know, the open AI approach. So in that respect, Dota is certainly a little bit more susceptible to reinforcement learning approaches versus StarCraft 2. You can have perfect micro, let's say you can micro your Reaper perfectly or your Marines. There are very good examples for that. And we, we have that even right now uh, in scripted fashion, but they're like near perfect. But they will always lose against the greater decision making of bots that have, right. you know, superior, well, just decision making. You know? And that's the really interesting part about StarCraft bot making is that a lot of it revolves around the decisions and not about perfect micro. Like, and it, that's a major misconception that micro gets you far. It doesn't actually. Macro your decisions. decisions are important. So I actually demonstrated this on a stream I did yesterday, I think, 
maybe the day before, where uh, one of the bot authors said, my bot has perfect micro against banelings. You cannot defeat me with fling bane. And I said, sure I can. And I turned to my stream and I played against the bot and I killed it with Ling Bane because it had perfect micro against Banelings in that it would never, ever get touched by a Baneling. So I just didn't blow up my Banelings. I just walked the Banelings in and watched yeah. as the bot ran away from them. And it, 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 <laughs> yeah. it died, right? Because it, it, it was told never, ever, ever go near a Baneling. And I said, okay, maybe it, I think it might have sent, you know, one Ling. And I was like, okay, I just, will move command my banlings. And then it just died. It took the worst fight imaginable. There's there's a balance between perfect micro and making a good decision. And a lot of the bots that have perfect micro, perfect, uh, die to surrounds, they die to any sort of unexpected thing because perfect micro isn't always perfect stutter step. Perfect right. micro involves a lot of situational decision-making that the bots right now don't have. Yeah, one thing that we've essentially never seen a bot do is dive for something to see to see that there's a line of troops and a tank in the back, and it's never dove to jump on the tank. But that's something a human would do, and like we've seen way too much like timidity. And is that something? It's obviously a variable of some kind, and we kind of discussed it on, uh, you know, Reapers functioning, and none of them wants to die or be the one to sacrifice itself. <laughs> is that kind of a variable that you can play with to say, stop being so timid? It's okay. Like these are acceptable losses. This is what you should do. Totally. Oh, yeah. And and like at least in in my case, um, for the for the Sarsa approach, actually going to publish a video maybe next week or the week after. Um, to show how you can extend that approach to different units or even large scale battles uh, where in a sort of human like fashion it cycles through the different uh, individual unit groups and do and you know tries to do the optimal actions for each of these unit groups and like actions can include like scattering apart you know when it's engaging for example a um, a tank or banelings where it could mean move backwards or attack forward or focus fire or things like that. So, you know, with enough training and enough iterations and, you know, these, these do actually take a lot more training. You can definitely get that behavior where you focus fire certain things like focus fire on a carrier, focus fire on, uh, on um, tanks or like spread unit units apart, you know, basically magic box the muters and attack the Archon, uh, stuff like that. So it's definitely very possible, but it takes, at least from a machine learning perspective, more time to get right. this implemented. Yeah, it so makes sense. I think okay. if we go to the next thing they show in the DeepMind video, it actually has a good sort of example, which is the yeah. worker rush okay. bot they showed. Right. Yeah, unfortunately, we're gonna we're running a little bit on time because we're running a little bit over. Um, I wanted to throw out one last thing out there to you guys before we begin to wrap up, um, but. When it comes to building your bot specifically um, for competitive, how important is it to you that it mimics human restrictions? Uh, define human restrictions. So A APM, APM being probably the, the main one I could think of. Well, that's not necessarily a restriction because a, like it's per minute, right? And it's calculated over the entirety of the game. It's relatively easy to optimize the bots to sort of like reduce the actions to a point where it's not really necessary and increase it to like an inhuman level when it's necessary, for example, in a battle, yeah. you know. Yeah. So if, if APM is the defining criteria, then, you know, right now I tell you it's not relevant for me at all. But if it was about, you know, if, we, if, if there was some sort of like constraint to say the APM needs to be below. 100 or 180, uh, which is what DeepMind suggested, then, you know, that's something that could be added, definitely, I think, without too much of a problem. Okay, so maybe even a little further than APM, but even the idea of how it pulls in information and how it requires, like, maybe looking on the map, because we'll, we didn't get to get to this, but in the DeepMind video, it, it sh they will show that the bot, their bot uh, looks and, like, you know, does, like, a camera look and stuff like that, like, that kind of human mimicry. So, is that an important aspect of your bots that you guys built? So I think it's a very interesting question because that's exactly what differentiates um, the two Python wrappers, PySC2 and Python SC2, where PySC2 is done by DeepMind 
and that is supposed to mimic a human player moving the camera and doing everything. And Python has to, to just like all the other APIs, give you the raw information. So it, you just know there are like 10 Marines on the map. You don't have to look for them. And, and I personally, you know, personally, the way I see it is that the, um, the part of like counting the Marines and figuring out if your building has, you know, finished constructing stuff like that, that's sort of like, for me, that's sort of like a different feel. It's sort of like part of uh, object recognition, you know, visual recognition. And I kind of feel that if somebody specialized on that, it's almost like a different module you could plug in between you and the game, you know, from a machine learning perspective that just handles all the visual object recognition and just tells you, oh, you just saw 10 Marines. And that information goes then to my bot. So that's the way I, I see it. And that, that's the way, you know, I, I think it makes sense. Whereas DeepMind wants to do everything bottom up, you know, very much mimicking a human. Yeah, so I completely agree. So like, I'm not actually too concerned with how the bot like interacts with the game because it doesn't actually matter how the bots interact in the game. It still has to make decisions that are better than my decisions to beat me at StarCraft. And I think that's the interesting and hard part of StarCraft is making the right decisions given what you know. I don't care if it takes a million APM for a bot to beat me at StarCraft because if I can't outthink it, um, it's still beating me, right? So exactly. it, the, the, even if you created a bot that, for instance, worker rushes perfectly, perfectly, let's say it figured out the best possible way to worker rush. What if I just wall off before the worker rush gets to my base? I beat <laughs> it strategically. It doesn't matter that it's going to worker rush me with a million APM because it can't get through my wall. I don't think I'm personally not too concerned with the the constraints you put on the bot at least until they can make decisions that are good enough to rival the decisions humans would make yeah let's let's walk to let's learn to walk yeah. first before we run in a way you know so like so right now the AIs are just really dumb you know even the best ones are really dumb and yes. you know, hopefully, hopefully we get to a point where you know using the raw API you know where we have all the information we can find like or have a bot that is you know at a really advanced level and once we have that then we can still move towards okay now let's include the movement of the uh, uh, of the uh, window now let's include mouse clicks etc to mimic a human more accurately okay i see so it's kind of like the cart before the horse in many regards in terms of where we are at now yeah got it got it got it got it all right, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, and children of all ages, it is coming close to that time. But for our guests, I would love for, where can people check out the stuff you're working on? Um, because I know you both have really interesting things that you've been publishing. So thank you. Where can people get your stuff? So generally just everybody should be on, everybody who's interested in this kind of stuff should be on our Discord, you know, the sc2ai.net Discord. And if you just go on sc 2 ai dot net yeah right, and like go and join us I'm gonna see the link you can go on that and like you know everybody's super friendly everybody's super happy to get you up and running on your first boss there are many starter kits to you know to get an immediate bot you know right out of the bat so um that's a very good way to get started with and in the discord we also have a, a media channel where you can find all the past videos we also have a youtube channel um which is also linked in there and you know where you're gonna have bunch of different videos the tournament the most recent tournament the sarsa reaper video and you know the like uh okay. yeah pretty much same for me the the discord is an amazing resource and there's a lot of people who spend a lot of time there including me and nike you can probably find us talking there almost every day um and it's just great that like such a like sort of vibrant community has sprung up around the the api and like a lot of cool projects are being worked on, so everyone should check it out. Also mentioning that too is the, the Discord was mentioned by uh, DeepMind on the Blizzard video. So if people, if you, if you were, when you watch a video and anybody referred to a Discord, this is the Discord they're talking about. Um, so yes, awesome. That's uh, that's where people can find you and find more about you. Um, Make and just for purposes of audio, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this on either the VOD or in the future when hopefully we turn this into an audio podcast because that's has been requested, 
uh, make sure you can, that is fe2ai.net or in the show notes or the description. All right. Booyakasha. Um, on that part, let's wrap up the live stream element of this. So uh, before we get to the ending credits, Tara, why don't we reveal who the person was in the challenge video? Let's see if people guessed it correct. Yes. Let's see if you figure it out, guys. Did you guess it was Root Cats? Oh my God, surprise. If the first clue and the second clue didn't help it, the last clue should have definitely been the thing that gave that away. Um, Dave, did you get that? I, I, I did. <laughs> I figured it out. <laughs> you say I did, no. I did, I did, I did know that one, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. All right. Um, a little bit of updates and a little bit of uh, just the last closing notes before we end the show. Um, key thing to remember, um, we got some interesting news regarding Kings North starting up next week. So keep an eye out for that on Twitter. Follow us on Twitter, get that information. Um, Probot starts up, or at least registration goes up soon for the next season. So that happens, that's happening. And then, am I missing anything? Anything major? Oh, um yes so things that to remember about the show next week episodes if you ever want to get episodes and know what we have coming up in the, ahead of time and you don't have twitter or you don't have facebook any of those stuff we do have an email list um i hope this does this work awesome absolutely so follow our email list and basically before each of our show i send you an email of what the show is about a little bit of notes about the guests some note, um, some links for where to follow and um, find out information from past shows are in that email. So that's all for you guys, and that's really convenient. It comes to your email box. Last thing but not least, uh, we got our Patreon. Patreon, the ES Champ Insider Club, essentially is another way to support the shows and help help our production value for our shows. Um, pretty much helps you like you get access to the community, you get access to eventually some other additional stuff, but primarily helps us build our shows. And the last and not least way to support the show, and I don't think this has a bot command, but we'll find out. Uh, no, it doesn't, but subscribing. Subscribing lets you get to the shows first before other people do, because this stuff comes out on YouTube a couple of days from now, uh, Tuesday. So if you're watching today on Thursday, you don't want to wait till Tuesday you subscribe and get access to the show like right after we're finished. You don't have to watch it live. You can watch it later. So that's all those cool things. Endersword, where can people find you? Uh, usually here at Endersword on the Twitters. And, Tell me uh, Instagram. Tell me you did Instagram. Have you done that? I, I, I still haven't put anything up. Oh, but my it's, God. Uh, Ender, Endersword SC on Instagram. Maybe I'll do it now. Yeah, do it. To, you have to do it today. Like so follow yeah. him on follow him on Instagram because now he's gonna post pictures of Hawaii. Yeah. Um, I guess. Yes, you will. Yeah. You yeah. be able to do it. He promises you, or he'll give you all one Bitcoin. <laughs> exactly. That'll be it. <laughs> so that's all you can do. All right. Uh, follow me at Jacksama on Instagram because that's where I post personal stuff. But on everything else, specifically Twitter, at ES Camp, um, that's probably the best place. Actually, where I'm probably posting most ES Champ related stuff is on Twitter at ES Champ or that email list that I posted, uh, which you can get access from ESChamp.com actually. So 
go to ESGM.com and choose whatever one of our shows, which I believe ProBots is up there uh, inside the seat and then Kings of North. And you can just put your email on whichever show you, you care the most about on and you get emails specifically about that show. So other than that, um, I want to thank our guests for coming on to the show and being a part. And uh, if you missed this episode, guys, it'll be up on YouTube on youtube.com slash ESGM. Until the next time, thank you all so much for showing up. Um, I can't wait to produce some more episodes. Have a good night.